the story of ICH GCP is an introduction to GCP for investigators and site staff. My name is Roma Chilengi. I work for University of Oxford and I'm based at Kemri Wellcome Trust Research Program where we are doing clinical trials implementing GCP. I would like to share some views concerning GCP, its history, historical evolution and its current context as it is applied in clinical trials today. The learning objectives of this lecture, therefore, are to understand the relevant historical background to ICH GCP, to understand the role of regulatory authorities, understand the context and evolution of ICH GCP, to define what GCP means and its accomplishments, to summarize the key principles of GCP, to highlight potential benefits of GCP to the Global Health Trials Network, and also to critique some aspects of GCP application, especially in non-pharmaceutical settings. As we begin, it is important to look at the background justification of human subject research. Although human subject research is indeed experimentation on human beings, international guidelines have justified GC clinical research involving human subjects. And I would like to quote a couple of important internationally accepted guidelines. Um, uh, the first one being the Declaration of Helsinki, which in its introduction introduction says that even the best proven prophylactic diagnostic therapeutic methods must continuously be challenged through research for their effectiveness, efficiency, accessibility, and quality. The second quote comes from the SIOMS guideline, and this is that the collection, analysis, and interpretation of information obtained from research involving human beings contribute significantly to the improvement of human health. So the health that we enjoy and the services that we have today have largely come through uh, clinical tr research which involved experimentation on human subjects. So the importance of this slide is to show that although research in human subjects is a form of experimentation on human beings, it is justified because of the greater good that it brings to us as mankind. So human subject research has brought important achievements to medical practice today. A lot of examples exist, but to look at a few, um, the discovery of antibiotics have substantially improved human life in the way that we battle infectious diseases. Synthetic medicines have also helped reduce health costs. Substantial improvements in diagnostics are helping a lot with implementation of earlier interventions even for incurable diseases. And discovery of vaccines have helped to completely control some infectious diseases that were otherwise uh, having a high mortality burden, uh, especially in developing countries. So with these achievements, unfortunately, there's been historical tragedies that have followed the, the, the scientific breakthroughs. The current understanding of human genetics largely benefited from Dr. Menengel's unethical human experiments. The Nazi war crimes were also scientifically very revealing. A lot of what we learned in human physiology was obtained through those unethical experiments. And the famous uh, later ones, including uh, the Tuskegee experiments, 
the Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital uh, research and also research among mentally retarded children are some of the few examples of the problems that human subjects research has brought for us. In view of these problems that come with human subject research, it became important that human subjects research should be regulated. With advancing medical research and the revolution of drug discovery, the need to develop and market new products in, for human consumption was increasing and a lot of human subject research was also increasing. However, public attention was drawn by questions that surrounded the scandals and abuses of human subjects that came from uh, these developments. And governments were historically aware of the potential of medicinal products to cause harm, even when they were well intended. Individual governments would therefore realize the need to regulate the process of product development through clinical trials. There are historic, historical triggers that are documented in literature that caused particularly regulatory authorities in the United States, uh, within Europe, and also in Japan to begin to regulate clinical research for product development. Um, standing out among these in the U.S. was the tragic syrup formulation accident in which uh, children died from uh, wrong information that were, was used to make a decision on a syrup formulation. Within Europe, we had the thalidomide poisoning within the 1960s, which had a lot of uh, toxicity and caused a lot of congenital abnormalities on newborns. And in Japan, for no specific examples, it is said that the government regulations were lifted in the 1950s to ensure that uh, clinical research is tightly regulated. As we discuss the concept of GCP, it is important to identify the central role that regulatory authorities play in GCP. Regulatory authorities are usually government agencies or organizations that are empowered by governments or in, uh, to decide on and promulgate laws and regulations in force in a country or the member organizations. They also control and enforce the application of regulations surrounding uh, clinical research and implementation of product development activities. The fundamental obligation of these regulatory authorities is to evaluate product data on its quality safety and efficacy before it is allowed to be used in public. So historically with the increase in new and synthetic drugs, a lot of, a lot of trials and research and development work in the 1960s picked up. And by the 1970s, most countries, whether they had initiated product registration or not, saw a proliferation of laws and regulations that guide reporting and evaluation of product data. Although the fundamental principle of, of these organizations is the same, detailed technical requirements diverged over time from country to country. Industry thus found it necessary to duplicate expensive tests, procedures, and trials in order to market their products internationally as it was a requirement by the different regions and countries to meet those technical requirements. 
with the rising costs of health care, the escalation of costs in research and development, and the need to meet public expectation that research is relevant, and also to minimize the delay in making safe and efficacious treatments available to patients in need, the need to rationalize and harmonize regulation was the major driving force to bring together regulatory authorities uh, to look at harmonizing their requirements so that product data can be accepted across different countries without the need to repeat or delay uh, the implementation of trial results. So within the ICH, which is the International Conference on Harmonization, it is one acronym that will be used a lot when you discuss GCP because that was the founding organization for what we now understand as GCP. So the ICH was pioneered within the European community in the 1980s following the European Union achievements in making a single market for pharmaceutical products. The success of the European Union demonstrated that harmonization was indeed feasible even across borders. Therefore, bilateral discussions between Europe, Japan, and the U.S. on possibilities of harmonization began and they were pushed largely by pharmaceutical industry and also regulatory authorities within Europe, uh, the United States, and Japan. In 1989, in Paris, a landmark conference on drug regulatory authorities laid specific plans for action to materialize on harmonizing regulations for product development. And soon afterwards, authorities were approached by the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association to discuss a, a joint regulatory industry initiative on international harmonization and ICH as we know it now was conceived. In April 1990 in Brussels, Belgium, representatives of the regulatory agencies and industry associations of Europe, Japan, and the United States met primarily to plan uh, an international conference, uh, but the meeting was also discussing the wider implication and terms of reference for ICH. Among other stakeholders always present in these deliberations was the World Health Organization, which contributed uh, to the technical discussions. And later on, other countries, notably the Nordic countries, Canada and Australia, were joining the ICH region. And this is important to note that ICH is frequently referred to as the tripartite agreement uh, between the US, Europe, and Japan, uh, mainly because it was pioneered by these three regions. What did the ICH achieve? The harmonization process accomplished a, agreement on the content and format of the clinical study reports, which we refer to now as E3 guidelines, to a single format for reporting the core clinical studies which make up the clinical section of a drug registration dossier. The ICH also removed the redundancy and duplication in the development and review process such that a single set of data could be generated to demonstrate the quality, the safety, and efficacy of a new medicinal product. ICH was also moving towards 
a single set of data for a new product focusing on developing a common technical document. And to facilitate these processes, it was important to generate guidelines that will help, uh, help guide the process of, of developing these uh, clinical trial data that are intended to be submitted to regulatory authorities. And on this premise, the famous guideline on good clinical practice was born. And good clinical practice was then defined as an international ethical and scientific quality standard for designing, conducting, recording, re and reporting of trial data that involves participation of human subjects. It's important in view of the background just described to recognize that the definition of ICHGCP now comes to broadly embrace all trials that involve participation of human subjects. The basis of the ICHGCP is, in, is enshrined on the principles of the Declaration of Helsinki. And it is said that compliance with this GCP standard provides public assurance that the rights, safety, and well-being of trial subjects are protected and that the clinical trial data are credible. There are currently many forms and versions of GCP as adopted and modified by different regions, uh, particularly including the FDA in the US, the WHO, the European Commission's Directive on Clinical Trials in Japan, Australia, uh, South Africa, and other countries. All these countries that have subscribed to the ICH GCP have then taken on the general GCP guidelines, adapted it, and incorporated into their local laws that regulate clinical trials. It is important at this stage to review the scope of GCP as it is seen today. As we saw in the definitions, it refers to all trials. And a trial in this context is any research study that prospectively assigns human participants or groups of humans to one or more health-related interventions to evaluate the effects of health outcomes. That is a very broad definition of research in human beings in general. And a good description of a human subject would be a living individual about whom the investigator obtains one, data through intervention or interaction with the individual, or two, identified, uh, identifiable private information is obtained in that interaction with a view to make generalizable knowledge out of it. So the scope of GCP is very, very wide, and it embraces all studies that qualify to be called trials as long as they involve human subject participation, whether or not pharmaceutical industry is involved. It also means that studies that satisfy the GCP standard should internationally be accepted regardless of whether, regardless of where they were generated. A good summary that has synthesized the GCP guidelines is reflected in the WHO principles of GCP. And these have been summarized into ethical conduct of research. And research must be described clearly in a protocol. There has to be risk identification and justification for it. And there has to be a clear benefit and risk assessment. The research has to be reviewed and approved by appropriate 
independent ethics review committees or institutional review boards. There has to be compliance to the approved protocol. Informed consent must be obtained from each individual participating in the research. There has to be continuing review and ongoing risk-benefit analysis even to approved protocols. Investigators must be qualified by training and experience for the roles that they assume in a clinical trial. Appropriately qualified staff must be delegated various tasks in the clinical trial. Records must be kept and maintained in a systematic format and a listing of essential documents has been provided. Confidentiality and privacy must be respected in the process. Good manufacturing practices must be observed and documented and quality systems should be in place to reflect both the quality control procedures and quality assurance mechanisms in place for the clinical trials. GCP implementation has also been faced with some resistance, and in this slide we reflect the downside of GCP. It is important to observe that GCP primarily served the interests of large pharmaceutical industries and so fails to accommodate non-commercial trial settings. GCP has also not adequately addressed some key elements such as the trial randomization process. GCP is inconsistent on individually assigned informed consent and fails to recognize the non-Western cultures whose prime considerations could include the entire community rather than the individual. Regulatory authorities and study participants have been attributed a lot of rights and authority and yet no obligations. The GCP guidelines have further been criticized as a broad bronze standard, not transparent and lacking a rigorous peer review mechanism. In the context of our global health trials network, clinical trials can be globally done at GCP standards. And underdeveloped partners in the tropical areas can fully participate and contribute to product development and the data generated would be internationally accepted. GCP can be interpreted and applied to pragmatic studies to generate scientific and ethically sound data. Quality trials can also be done at reasonable costs while reflecting GCP requirements. There is a list of relevant literature that can be consulted for further reading when studying the subject of GCP in clinical research.